right, Jason. Well, thanks for uh, meeting me back out here again. For uh, I don't know if this is our second or third interview. Yeah, third time. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if the second one actually ever made it online, but there's definitely <laughs> at least one, um, which has a couple hundred views. So hopefully, some people are benefited from the information. But so, can you start out? Tell us uh, where are we today? Yeah, absolutely. So this is uh, this is Turkey Creek Preserve. It is owned by Borough Land Trust, who I work for. Uh, this is one of the properties that we own and manage in Johnson County, and it's about 107 acres. Mm. It was donated to the trust back in the early 80s um, from some, for some local families, and we've been managing it for the last couple decades. Um, the vast majority of this land used to be agriculture, and so uh, we restored it to prairie, and we're kind of uh, helping restore the, the wooded areas that you see around us. So can you give us a little overview of what is Baroque Land Trust? So this is one of the properties, but... Yeah, so we have about 500 acres that we own and manage. Um, we're a land trust, so like our, as a nonprofit, our whole goal is to work to provide uh, more conservation efforts in the community. Mm -hmm. And then one of the unique things about our land trust is any of the lands that we own and manage are open to the public. Mm -hmm. And so we're providing additional spaces where people can get out and enjoy nature. Um, there's a ton of educational programs that happen out here. There's some after-school programs that are using this this particular property almost every week. Um, so we're just we're providing more nature opportunities for the community and also for the, the natural resources, the plants and animals uh, of this area. Yeah, and I was looking online. Uh, everyone should check out the Borough Land Trust website. Um, I'll show a map of the different properties. You said you're up to what six or seven of different properties. We have twelve properties. Oh, 12 properties. Yeah, twelve yeah. properties total. The smallest yeah. one is under an acre. Yeah. Um, but it's such a unique little property. It has just phenomenal diversity. It's remnant prairie. Um, we normally wouldn't try to protect an acre that's surrounded by development and everything else, but with this one in particular, it was just really unique. And so that's our smallest. Our largest is another property that's similar to this. It's about 107 acres mm -hmm. down in Washington County. And so it's kind of everywhere in between. Interesting. And so your journey going from your previous work um, it, almost a secondary, like a, a first career and then a pretty complete shift into what you're doing now yep. uh, intersects interestingly with your work now at the Borough Land Trust. So can you describe sort of that evolution of where you, where you came from and how you got to where you are now? Sure, yeah. So as soon as I graduated from college uh, in environmental science, I actually started working for uh, a, a local environmental organization mm -hmm. um, doing for-profit work and then decided to, to you know, join up with a couple of friends and start my own business, um, which I own still a small portion of that business now, doing uh, restoration projects. And so we were working on land restoration projects, um, you know, just for private individuals mostly. After that, I ended up getting back into education, or getting into education, I should say, and uh, got into the nonprofit world. Mm -hmm. And then I was, I was you know, doing that for about 12 years in educational nonprofits. At that point, decided I really wanted to get back into natural resources, and so I uh, was fortunate. Borough Land Trust was actually looking for a land steward at the time, and then a year after I started, I became the executive director of the organization. So your nonprofit work, or sorry, the educational work, was in sort of statistics, right? Like at some point, you went and got yeah. So I went back, got my uh, master's degree from the University of Iowa's program, in which is how we know each other. Statistics, ultimately, right? Through, right. Grant, which, through our Grant, our cameraman, and, and Julian. Um, and so yeah, that I I was doing that, and then I also just nonprofit management as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's a it's a far cry from what I do on the day to day. However, you know, there's this whole component of data analysis. There's a whole component of utilizing metrics to show um, increases in performance and all that stuff that we're able to do. It's important for nonprofits. It's important. What kind of metrics do you keep track of? So a lot of it is is acres. Mm -hmm. um, so when we are trying to protect land, uh, the more the better. Um, and so that's one thing, but also uh, number of hours of, of management work that's being done on these properties. Mm. And so it's not real, like we're not getting into statistical analyses for most of this stuff. However, there are some. Um, there's something called the, the floristic quality index that we utilize on our properties. It's essentially like how green are things? It's, it's basically how native are things okay. and how, how conservative are the species that are on the property. Mm. And so I'll, I'll do the, the 10 second version, but sure. if you have species that are very sensitive, they're not going to grow in areas that have been disturbed too much. Mm. And so if you have a lot of those conservative species in an area, you know that it's a high quality remnant. Mm. And so you wanna search out for and protect those areas. Mm. And so when you, when you analyze all of vegetation, you can put it through these calculators and determine what their floristic quality index is. Mm -hmm. And then that will give you a, a, a way to determine your next step in restoration. 
And, and a lot of those most sensitive species would be sort of the herbaceous layer, right? Absolutely, yep. Um, the herbaceous layer is what we utilize for the FQI, the Fluxic Quality Index, but then you can also look, start looking at things like what uh, pollinator species do you have, what mm. bird species do you have, what mammal species do you have. Um, there's some phenomenal stuff that are on these, these properties that we have. This particular property right here, uh, we actually have an endangered species, the rusty catch bumblebee. Mm. Uh, we have a population, it's the first place that we found it uh, on our properties in 2017. And so um, we utilize all that information to try to determine what the best management plan would be, mm. and then we just get to work. And so last year as an organization, we had about 13,000 hours of just land management work done with our staff and our AmeriCorps team. So it's a pretty massive amount of hours. I, I want to get back into the benefits and challenges of managing that part of the nonprofit with AmeriCorps and other yep. programs like that. Um, but I think there's an interesting anecdote that you've shared with me previously about when you were making the transition from your educational uh, work uh, which in many ways was perhaps more remunerative, but not so emotionally satisfying as what you decided to go in. And at one point you described writing a, a CV of the things you're most proud of. Yeah. And that being sort of a pivotal, can, so can you describe that process? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I kind of stumbled across this idea of um, when, you, when you're kind of stuck, and I wasn't necessarily stuck in a job that I didn't enjoy, but I just didn't feel fulfilled. I didn't feel like I was, it wasn't a midlife crisis by any means, but I didn't feel like a I was- midlife optimization. There you go. Uh, I didn't feel like I was just contributing enough to the society, I guess, in general, by doing the work I was doing. And so I, I stumbled across this idea of not writing a CV or a resume for like that job that you think you might be able to get, but really trying to develop out a, a job of what you're most proud of, and that way you can kind of see like what the best job for you would be. And so I started writing about like all this work that I've been doing at Land Restoration on my own property, on some stuff I had done in the past, the things I'm most interested in. Um, and th that was really pivotal for me. I didn't necessarily use that exact uh, version when I was you know, trying to get this other job, but I definitely pulled from it. And so it was just a, a nice way for me to reconfigure like what I really wanted to do with my life. And it was, it was not an easy move. Um, you know, the nonprofit world, it, it can be a little bit more difficult financially. Um, in Johnson County, I, we have a phenomenal number of, of nonprofits, and, and it's, it's a great, uh, great community to be in. But financially, it's a little more difficult to do some of this work. You also mentioned that you have uh, at least one business. I don't know if there's multiple businesses that you're a part of. And I know at least a part of that is prairie burning. Mm -hmm. um, we did that on your own property with your with your uh, water truck or whatever yep, you call it. Yep. Um, how do you, do you have any thoughts? I think sometimes people, like especially a relatively liberal place like Iowa City, tend to have an aesthetic preference for nonprofit over not for profit or for profit but towards a good aim. Do you have any thoughts on parsing the differences and the benefits between those various Legal structures and ideologies. Yeah, uh, so I, I love I love working for nonprofits. I, I really don't see myself ever not working for nonprofits in the future. And a, a big part of it is we have the ability to help when needed in really any capacity. And, and and we don't try to get too far from you know our our mission. We don't want to do mission drift. But when there's a problem and as an organization we can help solve it, like we love to do that. So that's fantastic. Hmm. Um, with a for profit, you always have to have that kind of bottom line. If you have investors, if you have have, um, individuals that have contributed, like wh whatever it is, like the, the financial component of it almost has to drive that organization. Mm -hmm. However, I will say there are there's an absolute need for the synergy between the two. And so we do a lot of work with for-profit institutions. There is some land that we just are not able to help manage, aren't able to help protect for whatever reason, mm -hmm. and for-profit institutions are able to come in and do some of that land management work. And so as a nonprofit, if the land is protected in some capacity, anything from you know, an NRCS contract or an outlaw on a, a subdivision or a conservation easement, as an organization, we're able to come in and help manage it. But if it's just private land that, that has no protections on it, it's not in the public good. Mm. And so it doesn't make sense for our organization to work on it. That's when, that's when the for-profits come in and can do some great stuff. Mm. Okay, that makes sense. 
Now, uh, can we, I'd like to talk about your, your other property, so the property that you and Natalie initially got. Yeah. Um, how's, any updates on that? It's been a couple of years since we talked about that last. Yeah, so um, I, I wasn't there a lot this, this winter, mm -hmm. but I'd done quite a bit of work uh, clearing out a lot of invasive brush in, in the fall. Mm -hmm. And so I just got back down there about a week and a half ago. And what um, are some of the biggest problem species? You've been uh, so we have some olive species that are uh, a pretty big issue. Um, there's some cedars that are popping into the prairie, with cedars being native, but they will spread in prairie if you don't burn enough. Mm -hmm. um, we have some, a little bit of honeysuckle, but not too much. Um, and there's garlic mustard, of course. Mm -hmm. But really the big one right now is the olive species that I'm really trying to You mean to like an autumn olive or a yeah. Russian olive? Yep. Or? yep. Yeah. And so that's the, that's kind of the, the, the dominant invasive species that I'm really trying to work with right now. Now, interesting. I, so autumn olive, we are, like, where we differ is, uh, more of like the conservation, restoration ecology versus maybe an agroecology, permaculture sure. mindset. And so, you know, autumn olive being one of the species that divides people based on, you know, because it has nitrogen fixing qualities and it has sure. some sort of edible fruit. Um, but you, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, see, have seen it displace local vegetation. Right. Um, so I guess uh, this is a question I have later on in the list, but can you play with the different frames of mind with invasive species, kind of how we think about that, and then also the concept of a novel ecosystem. Sure. So I, I think the, the important realization that I've had is uh, not all non-native species are bad. Um, all native species are here for some particular reason. We know that. The non-natives come in, and if there is a, a niche that they have the ability to, to grab hold of, and just uh, run rampant, they will. And so the ones that we really have to watch out for are the ones, that, and you have the right word, it's displacement. Mm -hmm. And so there are some species that will come in and they will take over an ecosystem yeah. and they will wipe out the biodiversity. So I think a garlic mustard. Garlic, garlic mustard, great yeah. example. And so the, the problem with that is when you start decreasing biodiversity, because you're going from, you know, let's say 10 species that are in an area down to one being garlic mustard, the problem with that is you're also yeah. decreasing and you're also decreasing the ability for all the species that relied on those native species. They no longer have that habitat. Mm -hmm. And so that's, it's, a, it's a true problem in this area. The decrease in biodiversity is absolutely one of the reasons that Iowa has so many threatened and endangered species right now. So it's habitat loss and destruction of the, the, the food source for a lot of these animals. It's, it's kind of interesting to run the counterfactual if Iowa were a essentially undisturbed ecosystem beyond what birds and wind and water right. bring in from exotic species, how that would change the ecosystem run against the, the current situation, which what, 95% of Iowa's land is agricultural? Something really it, it, huge. It's about 70% okay. agricultural, a little bit more if you can if you consider grazing to be ag land, um, it's, it's probably closer to about 80%. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's that's a massive issue, right? Sure. And so you went from area that, that literally had thousands of species that could exist on, on an acre and sure. down to our current environment where you have, uh, it, it's, it's currently designed on 65% of this, this state to be uh, suitable for corn or soybeans, right. which is two species. Right. And so that is such a dramatic decrease in biodiversity. It's very obvious to see why that's a problem. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that we have to go back to, you know, 100% prairie, but there has to be a good mix. We can't go too far off the scale. Yeah, this is also a question I put kind of far down the list, but so your work with the land trust and your work as a private individual on your land is essentially 100% restoration work, right? As far as I know, there's not any sort of, you know, you don't have timber reserves, you don't, have groves of apple trees or something. You're not trying to get additional additional yield beyond community growth. Um, so I guess your other yield is like people care, right? Yeah, um, yeah, good. yeah. I, I'm curious what advice you would give to both suburban people and rural landowners that have, I guess, so you, so let's focus on the rural for a second, who have an economic need to make money off of the land. Sure. How they can fit in conservation and various practices uh, to promote wildlife diversity while still maintaining whatever bottom line they have. Yeah, absolutely. So there are some phenomenal resources through the NRCS mm -hmm. uh, that allow individuals, even if you're just planting corn and soybeans, there are great conservation practices that you can utilize. 
utilized. So things like prairie strips are phenomenal. And this is the practice where intermixed within the rows and corn and soybeans, you literally have strips of native uh, grasses and native forbs. Mm -hmm. And that increases the ability for pollinators to utilize that area. It reduces nitrogen runoff. It just improves so many aspects of the land. You know, I was talking to a graduate student, I'm at Iowa State right now, um, with the Prairie Strips. Iowa State's one of the yeah. schools leading that. And it was interesting because they had just got some results back saying that a Prairie Strip did not increase the yield of the corn in proximity to the Prairie Strip. So I think that seems like the wrong question to be right. asking here. Right, right. <laughs> Why would, you know, yeah. so I think the question is like, how does it help everything else? Right, the runoff so makes sense, if the, the question biodiversity. Is, if the question is how can we increase yield in corn and soybeans, that you're going down a completely different road at that point. And so now it's not about how can I make enough money to exist on this land, it's how can I make the most money possible? And that's a different question, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we wanna say, how can we kind of come to a happy medium here where you're, you're employing conservation practices to help the environment, but you're also still able to make enough money to you know plant next year, have a house, have a family, right. et cetera, that's a different question. Right, and, I, and I, I think we would both argue, it's a little preaching the fire at this point, but promoting long-term stability is a form of financial security as well. Absolutely. Um, and so if you're reducing topsoil erosion, that's obviously promoting that goal. Um, what would you say, so a lot of the work you do is taking degraded land, but perhaps there's still some amount of residual prairie on it or residual forest or what have you. It sounds like this was a field. This was a field, yep. Okay, so my question is, what are some first steps people can take when they're establishing a restored ecosystem from, I want to go both from a barren crop field and also in suburbia, like sure. a grassy lawn. Yeah, so with a, a barren crop field, it's actually a little bit easier than a lawn. And it mm -hmm. kind of sounds kind of strange, but there's a there's a history of, of weed seed being worked up by plowing and tilling mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And so sometimes the weed seeds are actually not as present in an agricultural field, especially because of the use of herbicide and everything else. Mm -hmm. And so one of the best things to do there is to, um, they, they will actually till the field, compact it, and then you can do either like a frost seeding or you can drill into that, that field native mm -hmm. seed. And so there's all sorts of uh, literature on the, like the ratios and the species and everything else. It's really good to focus on um, native ecotypes and native seed. It would be a phenomenal thing to be able to get it locally if you can. It's sometimes it's difficult to do so. Um, but really just getting in all those species that are native to that area. Mm -hmm. Have a good mix of grasses, have a good mix of forbs. Um, try to get stuff that's going to flower every, you know, during the entire year. And so yeah. from kind of the uh, April, May, all the way through August, September, October, you want to have stuff flowering all the time. That's the best way to do it on a field. With a, with a lawnscape, um, it's a little more difficult because, uh, well, one, it's not on that, that big of a scale. And so you're not talking about acres normally. Normally you're talking about a pretty small area. And so you do have the ability to remove the sod where you're just like actually cutting it out and taking mm. that, that thin layer of sod off of there mm. and then putting plugs in. And so if it's not, if it's like, mm. you know, a 10 by 10 area, one sure. of the quickest ways to get prairie going is to put plugs in. They're cheap, um, they're just little bare roots and mm. so you can kind of stick them in there, have a good mix, stuff that isn't going to get too tall, uh, stuff that isn't too sensitive because it's difficult to get yeah. going in a yard. And I, I have a specific case study, it's a little bit too formal for it, but you know, the friends, I sent you a text a couple years ago, um, but two friends in the morning with a, uh, about a, uh, maybe a half an acre or something mm -hmm. of a, they were looking at restore prairie, and they contacted a representative of a various government agency, I'm not sure what specific Polk County conservation uh, person it would have been, what agency. Sure. But the advice was to chemically burn it down once or twice. I think it was maybe a fall and then a spring, and then the seed application, a heavy yeah. black-eyed Susan, I think was the prominent species the first year, to try to get a shade canopy going, and then I think they did various other um, things. But it's interesting because our, our parents got similar advice. They mm -hmm. have a, say, a 10 acre field with a fair amount of big blue stem, a fair amount of Ohio spiderwort, various other uh, goldenrod, other species, and I think some invasive grasses, like low, like uh, what do you call them, cool season grasses. Yep. Um, but pretty good life. I mean, there's plenty of bugs flying around. It seemed, and the, the advice was to spray it and till it and put it into corn and soy for two years to basically kill the seed bed and then to completely redo it. Right. And I wonder how you come on this. To me, it seems like lunacy, especially considering that after those two years of establishment, you're still going to be battling non-native species. Correct. Right. And so then to me, it seems like your plug idea makes a lot of sense where you're introducing diversity and accepting with practices like mowing and burning 
that you're going to have a novel ecosystem no matter what you do. So one of the difficult things is when you're talking about prairie establishment, it's, it's an issue of scale. And so again, plugs work fantastic if you're talking about a 100 square foot region, that's great. You can't do that on an acre, let alone mm -hmm. 10 acres, right? And so you need to have a way to um, <coughs> get back to kind of square one with some of these properties so that you have the ability to get a, a good introduction of native plants. Mm -hmm. If you just throw native plants into non-native uh, seed, uh, you know, weed patch, it's not going to be able to compete well enough early on. So the mm. little the little seedlings are all going to be shaded out. So you need to you need to start over. I never necessarily advocate for um, taking something that has some native species, killing it, putting it in corn and soybeans, and then coming back. That doesn't necessarily seem to be the best way. I would never personally do that. Um, there may be a good reason. I don't know. In your situation or in your parents' situation with ten acres. Uh, getting a good inventory of what is there is critically important, mm -hmm. right? And so if you look and you say, hey, we have five native grasses and we have ten forbs, and that's what we're starting with, that's a decent starting place. Mm -hmm. And so it would be lunacy to say, let's just spray everything down, because mm -hmm. now you are killing all those native species that are currently there, and then you're just going to be bringing in seed from someplace else to replace it. Well, and, you know, given that it's next to roadways and neighboring right. properties and forest that is kind of a different system of management. Those, I feel like the species that are non-desirable in the prairie will reintroduce themselves almost immediately no matter what you do. Right, right. So and that, that is a problem with small prairies, a lot of edge on them, um, close yeah. to other areas that have a lot of invasive seeds. And so the best thing to do in that situation is there are, if you only have cool season grasses that are popping up early in the year, you can do herbicide application to help reduce those down. There are ways that you can do it so that it doesn't kill the native grasses that are warmer season grasses, they come up later. It doesn't kill the uh, the forbs that might be popping up. And so brome eradication, cruel seeds grass eradication, is a it's, a, it's pretty difficult to do. And the best way to do it is over time, you just have a more dominant warm season grass and then burning when possible. But a lot of times, burning in a more uh, suburban or some rural environments near roads, near houses, it can be difficult to do, mm -hmm. um, but it is, it is possible. It, I have two questions. One on the practicality of burning. Mm -hmm. um, if people are interested in doing any scale of burning, are, are there any resources you would recommend they reach out to or read a book or whatever? Yeah, so the Iowa State Extension actually has a series of really good PDFs that talk mm -hmm. about all the equipment, developing a burn plan, um, kind of the mechanics behind how to control the burn, all of those. So Iowa State Extension has some good resources there. Mm -hmm. There are some videos that are available through the, um, the, the Tallgrass Prairie Research Center out of UNI, mm. and so they have some um, nice information about how to conduct burns. Mm. Um, there's a couple books that are out there. It's one of those things that's a little difficult to go from uh, reading about it in a book sure. to actually doing it in a safe way. The other problem is there is a level of equipment you just need, and it, it, it can be fairly expensive. And so it, there's a safety component. I don't suggest that people ever uh, try it out for themselves and mm. see if it works or not. Sure. I'm, I'm a big advocate of, of safety with burning. And so if you have the ability to, to, to watch or to join up with some sort of crew as a volunteer or something like that, mm. with regards to liability, uh, one of the problems that we have is we can't just accept volunteers anymore to help out on the burns. And so we don't have the ability to like teach people how to burn. As Borough Plant Trust. As Borough Plant Trust. Is that something that you used to have the ability to do? We did. But as we, as insurance changes, as sure. our organization gets larger, as more resources mm. are put into various areas, mm. we just don't have the ability anymore to take on that, that liability. It's too much of a risk Does for that us. include like AmeriCorps volunteers? It or? doesn't. They're not volunteers. Okay. And so AmeriCorps members are paid, but they sure. also have, we also do things like there's workers' compensation insurance, mm. they're included within all of our insurance plans. Mm. And so for, for the liability concern, um, they are covered. The other thing is we, we do training with all of them, and so mm -hmm. all of them are NWCG Type 2 certified firefighters. Okay. And so yeah. they're not just some random volunteer that's coming in and say, hey, I want to learn about burning. Sure. They're trained individuals by the time they're on their first burn. Hmm. And so my other question, we were talking about brome grass, and we were talking about niche availability. Yep. Can you imagine a novel ecosystem that incorporates some cool season grasses in a even more healthy than native prairie? Uh, well, no, not necessarily. I think that the, the, when you think about like the most 
diverse or the most healthy prairie, mm. it wouldn't have any sort of non-native species in it. They're not designed for this region. They're not designed to interact with the species. And so they're at best, they're just gonna be taking up space. At worst, they're gonna be out competing other species. Mm. And so I, I, I'm, I'm a pretty big advocate for if you really are striving for true biodiversity, true native species biodiversity, there's really no place for non-native species, be they invasive or not. And there's a big mm. difference there between non-natives that are invasive and not invasive. Now, when you're talking about your yard, having some species there that aren't going to spread because you want to have a, a peach tree, you want to have uh, you know whatever the species are for food production or for mm. flowers or whatever, if they're not going to spread, that's not that big of a deal. I'm curious if you, if you were a king, would you, or even if you were in charge of the government, <laughs> Iowa basically has no rules in terms of what you can plant. I mean, you can't plant marijuana, but like besides that, uh, I, like you know, other states have various rules on, uh, you know, even things like aroni berry, I believe, or like yeah. currants, or or right. say say honeysuckle. It's all over. Even Iowa State's planting it's on their campus. Has to be right. Would you do you think? I mean, you think that's ill-advised. Do you think that should be banned? Uh, so it's a regulation question. So there are some bans in Iowa. You can't per you can't sell, you can't purchase some um, invasive species. I've and seen it for aquatic species. I don't know if I've ever seen it for... There are some... I'm trying to think of some examples. Aquatic species is most common, mm -hmm. um, but there, I'm trying to think of the name of the... There's a... Oh, purple loosestrife is a good example. Okay. Right. Purple loosestrife is a species that is a... I believe it's a wetland species, so it's close to aquatic. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not legal to sell in the state of Iowa. I'm fairly certain. Okay. And um, but th so I think that more regulation would be helpful, but there are things like um, kind of going down that road, working with uh, landscaping companies, working with nurseries to try to inform them about the benefits of selling certain species versus others. Mm -hmm. One of the con one of the the current issues right now is uh, there's a species of milkweed mm -hmm. that is very colorful. People love it around their yards, mm. but what they're finding is it actually will decrease the survivability of monarchs mm. because it's not the it's not the milkweed that the monarchs necessarily need. Which species are we talking about? I don't know the Latin name of it. I'm sorry. I'll have to but look is it and the see. orange one? The no, because that's butterfly milkweed. Okay. The orange. Well, there's one orange one called butterfly milkweed. Right, that's what uh, That is that is native. That's a phenomenal one. I believe this one has might have yellow and orange flowers, but I'm not entirely and sure. A bit of red. I it might like, be, yeah. Yeah, I think I know the picture you're talking it about. Is a, it's a non-native milkweed species. Sure. And so, again, because it's pretty, mm. uh, they're selling under the tag of monarchs love sure. uh, milkweed, so it's a good thing for the environment to plant this thing, but in reality, it's an issue. I, on the same topic, there's a, this whole thing of Let's have more kids raise monarchs in cages and then feed them milkweed and then set them free. They're finding that those species that are raised in cages have a lower survivability rate mm. than those that are raised in the outside. And mm. so it's it's again it, it's counterintuitive to like getting back to true nature is the best possible scenario here. Raising monarchs inside isn't going to be the answer to to the survival of the monarch population. Protecting vast tracts of land, that might help help the situation. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if anyone would argue against that point. To me, right. the, the kid thing seems more like a... Education. Yeah, getting people to at least recognize that monarchs exist, right? right. Which is a challenge, right? Like bugs are not... True. Um, I, I think of things like box elder, or, or, or barberry is worse, right? Like at Ledges, I've seen various populations of barberry pop up, usually right. from suburbia with birds. Yep. Um, but I, I just wonder, I am sort of hesitant as a person to say like something should be illegal as opposed to, I believe, you know, if you can educate people away from it, I, I hope that they would opt into. Sure. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the idea of people know what the right thing is to do, and if they're educated, they will make the right choice. But no mm -hmm. one's educating them on what the problems with Barbary is. You can, mm -hmm. I mean, within, I would say, 20 miles of here, you can mm -hmm. probably go buy Barbary at 10 different places oh, sure. today. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what's the problem with Barbary? It looks fine. It's deer resistant. So the yeah. issue with it is those red berries are very attractive to birds. Birds eat them. They fly two miles away into a, a beautiful area that has been eradicated of invasive mm -hmm. species and those they drop those seeds. Mm -hmm. Right. So now we have a Barbary problem on a, on a property and it can spread rampant. Mm -hmm. There are some studies that are showing that tick populations are correlated with intense Barbary populations. 
Mm -hmm. So now you have an increase in the population of ticks because they will they'll live on barberry plants. Mm -hmm. So then you have the increase in tick-borne diseases. You have all sorts of problems with that. I wonder how much of that's just correlated. I mean, you as a statistician correlated with disturbed ecosystems, barberry being closer to more degraded habitat with probably lower possum population, presumably by being hit by roads and hunting and whatnot. Right, so there's any number, but for whatever reason, Barbary seems to be the species. It's not the same with honeysuckle. There's a worse okay. problem with honeysuckle, sure. but ticks aren't living on honeysuckle, mm. they're living on Barbary. And so again, it's just one of those issues where someone makes the decision, I'm at the store, they don't necessarily know all that stuff. It's gonna be difficult to educate them on that. Sure. And so the easier way to, to solve the Barbary problem is not to educate the, the you know 50 million people, it is to not make it legal to sell in the state of Iowa because now you're cutting it off at the root, so to speak. And so now Barbary is, isn't available as an option. I know, it, it's a difference of opinion. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, there's no, there's no beneficial reason to have Barbary in the state of Iowa besides the fact that deer don't eat it and it grows around houses. There's no I mean, I agree, and as like as a person, I'm interested in you know potentially having a nursery someday with more beneficial species. Sure. I'd, I'd probably include some exotic, non-invasive species as well. Sure. Um, but it's an interesting question, and, and certainly, I like as a person, I'd be more in favor of stopping the sale of it as opposed to criminalizing it. You know? Yeah, I'm not looking to to criminalize it. Where you know, there, you there, have a barbary plant. Yeah, there, we're we're pretty far away from that point sure. at this point in time. Um, but at, at this point, it, it is like there are on my block in town, mm. people have hedgerows of, of Barbary. Or like privet, you know. Privet, a, a, honeysuckle, yeah, sure. any number of the species. Yeah. I, so on a positive note, um, what are some signs when you're doing habitat restoration that tell you you're doing good work, that things are working as intended? Yeah, so this particular property, um, we were doing a, a massive honeysuckle and multiple rows eradication project mm. in this property itself. And we had um, uh, a species of, of orchid, a native orchid pop mm. up that we had did not have any record of being out here. Mm. Again, we've owned this property for decades. Yeah, People are on this property this all the, yeah, almost 40 years. Yeah. We, we've owned this property um, and we've been on this property and it's very commonly walked and no one's ever identified this species. And so the fact that we're actually able to get some of those species to come back, that's mm -hmm. massive. Same exact thing happened on another property. Uh, it was actually a different orchid species, oh, cool. but it was just, uh, uh, we were removing, we were reducing the canopy. We were taking out native and non-native trees because they shouldn't be there. And can you point out to people, I think most people in Iowa don't know this, that there are native orchid species. Yeah, so we have 36 wow. native orchid species in the state yeah, of Iowa. I would Iowa. have guessed about six. That's a, um, a number of them are either threatened or endangered, mm -hmm. um, and they are, they're, they're pretty amazing. Well, um, some of them are extirpated completely, right? Correct. Well, actually, of those 36, I don't believe any of them are extirpated. We have 36 currently in the state of Iowa. Oh, interesting. I believe. Okay. Um, but yeah, they're not, you know, massive species, um, but you'll have orchids that will get eight to 10 inches tall. Um, they're, they're, they're very sensitive, and so you're not going to have them in areas that have been, um, you know, farmed for, for a long time. They're not just going to pop up like, uh, uh, you know, various other species like a milkweed would. And so they, they do have to have be a, a very sensitive quality area. Do you think there's any regenerative technique that you could do to eventually, say in the order of 50 years, get them into a woodland habitat or a prairie oak savanna habitat, like these orchid species or other highly sensitive species? Yeah, so that this gets back to the, when you when you disturb uh, a chunk of land, it's in, let's say, ag land for, for 50 years, is there a way to put it back into prairie so that it's on par with remnant prairie? And the reality is, we don't think so. Um, not in the scale of what we're interested in, 10 years, 50 years, etc. cetera. Hmm. Um, you're talking about a, a, almost a complete destruction of the, the microbes that are living in the soil. And so one of the interesting yeah. things with regards to the orchids is that there's this symbiotic relationship with microbes in, in the soil sure. that allow that orchid to grow. So you can't just dig it up and put it in potting soil and grow it in your house. That's not possible. Yeah. The same thing, when you ruin that ecosystem by having ag on a land for 50 years, it's going to take perhaps you know many millennia in order to get that fully restored. And so that's just, a, it's a difficult time scale for us to, to work on. Have you or anyone that you're familiar with experimented with exogenous soil transplantation? 
as a means of restoring yep. that microbiome? So I have not, but I know that it has been done. I've I think heard of trees before. Yeah, and I, th I think it's also it's an issue of scale again, sure. right? And so we're not talking about um, we're not talking about pots. We're not talking about you know uh, ten gallon pots. We're talking about how much you would need to actually put on a 10 acre, a 100 acre piece of property. If I were designing that, I actually would do essentially pots in a landscape distributed throughout with it. Sure, and then the hope would be that it would you know, eventually right. spread. And so that is absolutely possible. To my knowledge, no one's done that on a massive scale, mm. but it is, it is something that would be interesting. Would you ever, as a, like a Baroque trust or you personally in your property, if you find, you know, say a population of orchids here, would you ever transplant, say no. a pot into like a different, even on this property? No. No, so transplantation, so our, our goal is more um, let nature happen and provide it with all the right resources and the right, uh, the right system to allow it to do so. And so if those orchids are going to repopulate this area, the best, the absolute best thing for us to do is to make the rest of the area high quality and then it, could, it can spread as necessary. Um, we, do some, we do some seeding. Uh, we do some, you know, uh, uh, we, we will plant trees, we will plant shrubs, but we do not transplant. We do not take from one area and put into another. We don't do that with animals, we don't do that with insects, we don't do that with plants. Hmm. And that, that, that's a stylistic choice, right? Because there, there would be some ecologists, you know, I've seen the advocation of various bumblebee species that have been shown to be slow migrators. Sure. I don't know if anyone's done this, but I've heard of people talking about transplanting them further north or right. in different climate zones as they up the mountain or down the mountain. Yeah, yeah. So again, I think if we are, or if we're really trying to save a population of bumblebees, um, having more human interaction and more human involvement is what caused that population of bumblebees to become hmm. extinct or not extinct yet, but uh, endangered. Hmm. Um, having, again, more human interaction and more human involvement is probably not going to be the long-term answer. Is it hmm. possible to take a population of bumblebees and transplant them to another prairie? Absolutely. Now you have two populations of bumblebees. That's fantastic. But trying to do that again on scale, it's, it's, you're, you're, you're working against a pretty difficult thing. So again, the best thing to do is allow them to naturally do what they normally would do. They'll, they'll go into areas that they've never been before naturally. Mm. Those areas just have to be good quality habitat. So really for us, it really is, it is all about developing the best quality habitat possible and then letting nature take its course. We're removing all the invasives. Some people say, well, that's not letting nature take its course. The problem is the human intervention early on caused no fire to be here, caused those species to be brought into the United States. So all we're doing is we're removing some of those barriers, some of those obstacles. And so that is human intervention, but it's on the positive side. Uh, to me, where I'm convinced by your argument, not that we have a disagreement, but where I'm convinced is there's just so much low-hanging fruit that like if the question is removing multi-floor rows and European buckthorn and all these things, yep. the, the, the things that shade out the, the underlayer, if th that seems so much more obviously useful or a bigger impact than transplanting micropopulations of orchids. Right. Um, even though I'm not totally convinced, I do think you could speed up succession with very intentional if one desire, if one had the manpower and had taken care of these other things. Sure, sure. Yeah. If I had unlimited manpower, if I had unlimited resources, mm -hmm. I would love to try to repopulate areas with, with native orchids. Right, That'd obviously leaving the main population intact is working well. Right, yeah. but like there, so the, the, the resources that we're working with mm -hmm. don't necessarily allow us to have those, those micro projects mm -hmm. that might somehow in the future um, lead to the ability for sure. a, a little orchid population to repopulate over here. We're talking about you know massive scale work. Yeah. So when I was thinking about the major techniques for restoring, I think it's the prairie, but to some extent in forest stand as well. Um, can you describe the role and the benefit of mowing versus burning versus grazing versus leaving certain areas fallow? Or just not disturbing them? Sure, sure. So there's actually, um, there's a great place uh, where I'll, I'll talk about that later, but so with regards to the most natural way to manage what used to happen, Iowa used to burn, this landscape used to burn, lightning strikes in the past uh, would start something on fire, there are no natural landforms in the state of Iowa to stop fire from spreading necessarily, there's some smaller rivers, things like the Des Moines River, Iowa River, things like that, 
um, fire could leap across those. Hmm. But you could literally have fire that started at the Missouri River and goes across the state of Iowa to the Mississippi River um, because there's no mountains, there's no major lakes, there's nothing to stop it, right? So fire is good. Fire was a, a, a good way for this ecosystem to basically keep some of those um, undesirable things from happening. So that's number one. If you have the ability to manage areas by fire, it's the most economical, um, it is the most efficient way to manage, and it's the best way to manage. Second best is very, very, very you know, low down on the ladder of management techniques. For prairie, it would be something like mowing. Hmm. But the problem with mowing a prairie is that you're not doing some of the, you're, 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 you're getting rid of some of the invasives that might be impacted by mowing, but all you're starting to do is develop a layer of thatch. Mm -hmm. So if you were to let your lawn grow until it was a foot tall and then mow it, but not bag it, not rake it, and then do that forever, you're gonna start developing a really thick layer of thatch and mm -hmm. your lawn is not going to be you know, very good at growing grass. It's even worse in prairies because all those little seedlings, all the seed that distributes can't work its way down in the thatch and so mm -hmm. it just desiccates and then the seed is dead. And so it never gets down to the soil. If it does get down to the soil somehow, and it starts to grow in the spring, all that layer of thatch is gonna shade it out. And so, again, if you don't remove that thatch, you're not gonna have a high quality prairie. Mm. So burning is almost necessary uh, for a large prairie to be uh, beneficial. The thing you can do with a small prairie, I have a prairie next to my house, um, in the late spring, I will mow it. I'll wait until all the, the bee species, uh, oftentimes bees will um, lay eggs inside the hollow stems of, of some of the plants, and so you wanna wait until those are out. Um, and so then I'll wait until late spring, mow it, and then rake it all off and get rid of all that material. And that, again, is that's that thatch removal process. You can't do that on 10 acres. So that's why burning is important. Uh, the other thing you mentioned was grazing. So grazing used to happen, grazing was fantastic. The species that grazed in Iowa the most would be bison, elk, things like that. Um, there are projects where people are trying to replicate that style of management uh, by using either, uh, usually bison, not so much elk. Um, it's, it's difficult to do. Um, the, the, the infrastructure is a problem. The, you go. Uh, the infrastructure is a problem because you have to have these, you know, fencing, you're, you're trying to do it in large areas, it gets difficult to do, you have to take care of them in the winter, all of that stuff. So I think it's an infrastructure problem with grazing. Cattle do not graze and they do not operate in the same way that bison did. So you can't just say, I'm going to graze with cattle instead of grazing with bison. It I'll push back a little bit on that. Sure. Because, so people like Alan Savory, I don't know if you followed the holistic management. But a big proponent of high intensity rotational grazing. Mm -hmm. um, and he works, does a lot of work. I, I think he's from Tanzania or Zimbabwe or something. Um, but in fragile ecosystems. And counterintuitively, his work has shown that under the right situations, under the right techniques, high density cattle grazing, even in fairly like arid landscapes, helps restore uh, forage and, and equidiversity. So this area over here is interesting because it looks like it's really uh, unkempt, you know? Well, let's, let's just take a moment to pause here, actually. Yeah. We're on our way to go talk about cattle, but this, to me, seems very emblematic of a lot of creeks in Iowa. It is, it is. And so you have, like, a, a pretty thick layer of vegetation because it's really, there's a lot of sun here. And again, it opens up down there because you're not getting as much sun. There are still some invasives in here that we're going to want to clear out. But a lot of this brushy stuff, it's not best for people to walk through. But this is phenomenal habitat for a variety of species. Bird species, predators, all sorts of stuff love this. Um, it'll be full of wildlife. So let's do so, a little species inventory, right? So yeah. Some... So there's, there's some redwoods. There are, you know, there's a variety of different vines. All the vines are native. Gooseberry. Gooseberry. There's multiple rows. This and is so a raspberry. This is a, there's a smilax species here. So another one that's native right. vines. Oh, yeah. So that's the one you call cat spot, right? Yeah. Do you know, if, you said there was both native and non-native versions of that, right? Um, I don't know if there is a non-native version okay. of that. It's certainly that one that, like, a... I don't prefer. <laughs> Just Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's not a I don't a think it's super thorny. Because it's very thorny. But it does have a good berry on it for birds. 
Um, but there's little chipmunks running around in there now. Mm -hmm. We have a population of there's oh, chipmunks yeah. right there. We have a population of mink that live out here. Oh, cool! And so there's just a, a wide variety of, of uh, animals that and love this type of habitat. Different than the weasels? They are. Okay, so I've seen a less weasel in my garden. Yep, which is kind of cool. Okay, so we were just having the conversation about cattle, and we decided to come to kind of a, probably the hardest spot of the property for me to defend my side, but I think we, <laughs> so let's talk about, like, about the role of grazing in a property for management's sake. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are some really interesting examples of this that are happening in Iowa. So people are utilizing uh, cattle to actually help eliminate some invasive species. So there's a property that the Nature Conservancy owns in Iowa, mm -hmm. and they are using cattle to help get rid of reed canary grass. Mm -hmm. So again, it's it's you can't just get rid of it by burning. You don't want to use too many herbicides, and so you have this integrated management plan where you you have cattle grazing on it, you burn it, and then presumably on a rotational schedule. Exactly on a ratio. So you you throw all of these things at it, and cattle are great. They 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 work for free. Although it's obviously you have to have infrastructure with fence and everything else, mm -hmm. and so it's it's a really good use of of grazing. Um, but it's difficult for me to say that I could solve problems, most problems I have, by putting grazers, by putting cattle, or by putting goats, or by putting sheep into a situation. You're, you're the, 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 the difficulties that you're going to have, it doesn't allow you to necessarily do it at the scale that you would need to. Again, it's a scale issue. I, I don't actually think, I don't agree with that point. Um, if you're going for diversity of plant species, I can see your point. Right, so like you are really focused on restoring the native, the native diversity, especially of the plants, and by extension, that'll get the arthropods and the birds and right. the native animals and whatnot. If you're going for large-scale restoration in the sense that we're putting carbon in the soil, we're improving pasture, even if it's not 100% native, there's more plants biomass on pasture, then I think large-scale, someone like Alan Savior would argue that the introduction of lots of animals with high density schedule that doesn't come back too soon sure. promotes improvement of ecosystem function if not maximal ecosystem diversity but a lot of these landscapes are highly degraded now the trend this does not true for a lot of people that just like do basically what a paddock with no rotation where right. the cattle just come and you can see that there's a pretty distinct decrease in the forage quality, a right. lot of non-native <laughs> multi-flora rows that they don't prefer, right. uh, some cedars and whatnot. Presumably they've taken out a lot of the other trees and only the ones that are left are these sort of undesirable versus right. the prairie, which, you know, this is the most flattened time of year. Uh, right, it doesn't look like much now, but there's a, the, you know, it's great habitat for well, one. and you can just tell, I know this isn't necessarily the most desirable, but just the amount of biomass Correct. on the surface of the ground. Correct. And this is still like little enough because you probably burned it last year or the year before yep. that this should still come up through. You can see little patches. Right. So when you think of what you, you mentioned something about the increase in biodiversity. And I would say I, I always find it very difficult to believe that um, grazing as a primary management tool would lead to the greatest biodiversity. Well, to be fair, I said biomass. Bio, okay, biomass. So it really goes down to what your goal is. Sure. And so our goal isn't necessarily um, biomass production. You're not looking for the most highly producing pasture. Correct. We're not looking for the greatest carbon capture, although I would argue also that carbon capture in a native uh, habitat is, is potentially as good as or potentially better than in something that's that's more artificial. It, well, sure, right, and this is why it's kind of an interesting part to go uh, in the property because clearly there's more root exudates and biomass being put underground, right. less soil disturbance than here, right? right? There's just more photosynthesis going on here. Right. <laughs> now, the question would be two of these prairies having 40 years of management uh, with a rotational grazing system that every time the cattle come through, they eat a lot of the carbon, then you turn most of the nutrient back to the ground. Right. When they're trimming the plants, the roots do some root pruning, making more die off in the soil. Correct. Um, so that would be the right comparison. So and, and I would say that a, a true rotational grazing program, if they were, if it was being done to mimic what was done naturally in sure. Iowa, which is, you know, you would have bison come through intensively within an area, a lot of disturbance over a short period of time. You don't have, you have some compaction in some areas, but not, you know, over massive spans for sure. 50 years. And some micro divots. That's water. a great way to do it. Yeah. Where is that happening? 
Well, so I think the the farm that I would reference is actually Wisconsin. So Mark okay. Shepard, um, but and he's not taking virgin prairie and doing this. Right. It was cropland in which he's restoring a pretty healthy amount of ecosystem function. Um, but and that's the kind of thing that I personally interested in doing in the future in Iowa. It, and that's where we where we differ. It's some amount of finesse management, not the end goal and whatnot. Sure, and I think that for, again, small scale, uh, I, it's a great idea. I think it'd be really interesting to try that. Um, as, a, as a management technique, it's much more easy for me to throw fire on this property oh, no, than, no. To, than yeah. to put cattle on this property with a strong rotational grazing in sure. order to do, you know, to mimic what bison used to do. Oh, for sure. And well, so, especially considering that your properties are distributed around Johnson distributed County. Distributed around, <laughs> yeah. you know, we'd have to worry about sure. fencing. There's all sorts of logistics problems mm -hmm. that you're, you're dealing with at that point in time. But you asserted that there was some intrinsic difference between buffalo and cattle, and I'd like to analyze that. That right. seems like an assertion that's not... It's hard for me to disprove because I don't have that evidence either, but it seems sure. like an assertion, not something that's scientifically proven. Yeah, so generally what happened in Iowa with cattle is that there's a, a, a pasture, an area that those cattle are on, mm -hmm. and they will congregate in, in areas they prefer, mm -hmm. and then that area gets compacted over decades and decades of sure. cattle just like, you know, stomping it down for the most part. And then what you have is you have these, you know, something like a cedar tree will pop up, and then underneath it, because the, the cattle aren't going to eat the cedar tree, you're going to have multiple rows pop up. And since they can't get into that area because there's thorns on it, they don't like it, that's when you have other invasives that pop up in there. And so you have these little islands of, of invasive species that will just start growing and growing and growing and, and start to dominate this, this area. This is actually fairly clean. There's some multiflora, but there's not a lot of honeysuckle. Um, there's some honey locusts over there. Same thing happens with that, even though it's a native species. And so I would say that there one of the problems that we have is the compaction is a major issue and then just the limited diversity of what happens when cattle start eating things they eat everything down See, it's like a golf course over here okay but my everything you've said so far is a management problem not a species problem correct and even buffalo to some extent if you go to um, probably the best example that i can think of in iowa is the neil smith wildlife refuge right. Um, and even there, they take their buffalo off. They don't do rotational grazing. It's just one really big paddock. Right. They don't have a very high population. Uh, and I think they take them off during the winter and put them basically in cells. Um, but they'll form wallows, too. Sure. Right? So both of them will do that. And uh, the people that do rotational grazing in cattle would say, so uh, Joe Salton, probably the best example of this, would say that when cattle are put in high density with a short duration and then rotated, they will eat everything because yeah. they're just, they're, their patterns change completely. When they have the ability to just walk around and only eat the choice bits, they're only going to eat the choice bits. Correct. Until you're left with almost no grass, a little bit of moss even, and then like, then multiflora rows. Right, right. And so I, I do think it is possible. I'm not saying that it's impossible, but I think that it's just, it's difficult. I think that it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a high amount of work in order to get to some of the benefits that you would have in other areas. Mm. Um, but like even with Neil Smith, Neil Smith isn't doing it with, with cattle. They're doing it with bison. Well, they're also not doing rotational grazing. They just—I think sure. it's the aesthetic, and that's cool, right? That's what if you have the the backing of federal right. spending, then you're in. Right. And that's the thing. And so, why do people? So, one of the issues is you have a lot of cattle in small areas, and in Iowa, the landscape can support that. And so, in Iowa, you can have you know X number of cattle per acre. When you go out west, in the air, it's such an arid environment. You're talking about so many so many acres per head of cattle. Well, but even then, I, like, I'm like. i only really familiar with Iowa, and even then, I'm not yet a cattle person. Sure. <laughs> I've seen cows, but I don't, like, I've never raised cows. Um, and I've watched a lot of YouTube, so that pretty much <laughs> makes me an expert. But there'd be people uh, like Alan Savory, who, you know, very in the, in the various arid areas of the world, yep. um, run pretty high density cattle. And like what, when they see it, they would say like, this is too rested, or that's too rested. You sure. know, it'd, it'd be the high density short duration. Too rested for? Well, and you get to those desert areas or the semi-arid places, you see a lot of like, you know, desiccation, you know, especially imagine that there's more space in between the sure. plants and you get just like that, that desert look where you have uh, oxidizing brown matter on top that hasn't been come and pinched off by the cattle and then, you know, shoots up new fresh growth. Yeah, so I, I am not going to uh, even pretend to understand about arid environment uh, ecology. And so it absolutely might be that if, if my guess is that the reason that they're having problems in some of those areas is not because of um, a, a natural change, but because of a human impact. 
And so now they're attempting to do something where cattle may have been native to those areas. Well, it not. wasn't cattle so much, right? It would be the water buffalo and the elephants right. and the rhinos and the, all of these native things that would come in during various seasons in huge numbers right. for short durations and then move on. Exactly. And yeah. so I, that's a great approach if they're able to mimic that. Mm -hmm. Again, you're trying to mimic nature. But at the same time, those those water buffalo, those elephant, etc., they weren't. They, they didn't need fencing. They didn't need someone, you know, trying to separate them up into certain areas. And what so, they would argue is it's the mimicking of predator pushing them. So right, they didn't have fencing. They right. had packs of lions and uh, hyenas and whatnot pushing them along. Right. Yeah. Mimicking all of that stuff, mm -hmm. trying to mimic the the predator prey interactions as mm -hmm. well as the you know dry season, wet season, etc. It, I, I, I would have a hard time believing that it's the it's easy to do, um, and so I think that if they have the ability to improve the landscape utilizing cattle in an arid environment, that's fantastic. Um, I think there are ways that you can incorporate cattle into management plans in Iowa. I would just say that it, it would be it, if your goal is to to maximize biomass, if your goal is to do you know one of these things, and cattle are an answer, fantastic. With regards to like maximizing biodiversity and native ecosystems, cattle really don't do that for us. And so that's why one of the reasons why we have not incorporated grazers. Sure. We have worked with goats to help yeah. eliminate invasive species. I was going to ask you about that. How However, yeah. um, it's a hassle, right? Yeah. And so, so goats kind of have a mind of their own. The infrastructure is not great, but it is. you have to have electric fencing mm -hmm. to try to keep predators out. There's a human component where people are interested. And so it, you have to do a lot of work to try to you know, get goats. They don't kill the species. They defoliate the species. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not a silver bullet. Um, but they can help reduce some of the vegetation in some areas. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that kind of sums it up, right? It depends on the tool and the context and, like, what infrastructure you have available. And the goal. And the goal, it, yeah. So the, I, I totally agree that there's plenty of good ways to improve things, especially because yeah. the conventional way we do on so much of the state is so bad that there's a lot Correct. of better ways to do it. You know, so, like, even if you were restoring this prairie, and let's say burning isn't practical, you could still mow it in right time periods, what, on a yearly or bi-yearly or every other year schedule yeah. to keep it in, in like a, a prairie as opposed to stopping whatever trees are not desirable. Correct, correct. But at the same time, you would have that thatch issue. Mm. And so you would be building up that thick layer of thatch uh, because mowing doesn't get rid of that. Decomposition is fairly slow when you have all that, that organic matter compressed against the soil. Mm -hmm. And so I would say it's possible you would be able to. Um, you know, I'm not sure how long it would take to mow this, but you know, again, we have the ability to to burn, and so that's what we that's what we do. Mm. But yeah, it is mowing would be more helpful. There's a prairie that I've actually been talking with someone. Um, they have about an 80 acre prairie, mm. not allowed to burn, and so I've been talking with them about the you know the ability to mow as, in lieu of burning. But there are some really big difficulties there, not necessarily the first year, the second year, but 10 years in. Would you say that a, if you were limited for whatever reason, but with a no fire, no grazing regime, and so your mowing was really your only tool available, would you say at that point a raking process would essentially be mandatory for ecosystem health? It would be, it would be beneficial. Hmm. Um, mandatory, uh, you know, it, you would have some species, your diversity is going to start to decrease, you're probably going to go to a very high density grass as opposed right. to forbs. Because they can just poke up right through the Exactly. Yeah. And so I, I think that you're you're gonna have a, a big species change. It's not gonna be a very diverse prairie over the, the you know course of many years. So speaking of this one specifically, are there any more plans? Like is, are you guys planning a burn on this this year or is this just gonna come up through the remaining duff? Not this year. Uh, the, the, there's another smaller prairie behind us. We actually burned that one last year. Uh, this one was burned two years ago. There, we may try to burn uh, a portion of this prairie um, this year, but we have other areas that are more uh, need to burn more, basically. Right, and there is benefit, correct, in maintaining some prairie that you leave unmodified for a given year just for insect diversity, correct? Yeah, so this prairie it looks dead and barren right now, but in reality what you have is you know thousands of eggs from butterflies, from bees, etc., that are currently waiting for it to mm -hmm. warm up enough that, that are currently in this prairie right now. And so if we were to take and, and burn this entire area, we would be killing all of those uh, eggs that are waiting to hatch. So we would never want to burn, if you have a 100 acre prairie, 
you would never want to burn all 100 acres mm. because you're getting rid of all those that, that population of eggs that are in there. So you would split it in half or split it in thirds or something like mm. that. Now, if it was a 100 acre prairie that is immediately adjacent to another 500 acre prairie, uh, feel free to burn mm. your entire 100 acres, that's fine. Um, but in Iowa, often what happens is you have a prairie and there's nothing but ag around it for miles. Mm -hmm. And so you are an island and you need to treat it as if like all of your population is going to come mm -hmm. from your own prairie. Now, uh, this is a little bit tangential, but on your property a couple years ago, you had a pretty early season burn, like, pretty, like early in the winter still, or I guess early in the spring, still partly winter. And unfortunately, and fortunately, uh, a species of snake, I, I forget what you called it. Smooth green snake. Smooth green snake, unfortunately succumbed to like a two Whenever you have one of those vulnerable species, your management plan has to be in the middle of the ground. So I, I should be burning that property when those snakes are 100% for sure in the ground hibernating. Because the, the, the risk of burning when they're up is not one that I want to take. And so that's when like I've altered my plans to some degree. That particular area I will burn when it's uh, in the winter. Okay. Have you seen any evidence of that? Yeah, yeah, and so, or with trail cam. And so, on that same property, um, the trail cam was also not that well. I had some dagger on that property. It was also really well. I was never used to it. Um, but the trail cam was really well. Yeah. Are there any other, so you mentioned the rusty patch fumble bee, we have some green snake. Are there any other key species that you're sort of managing for? Yeah, so we do have a population of warty fox turtles on one property oh, oh. that's threatened. Um, so, we're working with them. We're doing a lot of work to try to restore. wetland species that we've essentially drained all the wetlands? Not necessarily okay. actually. Uh, there's not a lot of mammals on that list mm. but there are a lot of insects and so mm. uh, you know more than 50% I believe of all the butterflies in Iowa are on that list right at this point in time. Um, there are some bee species. Uh, there's just there's a lot of plants. The vast majority of the, the species on that list are plants. Um, I have a question. So I something I have thought about in the future when my regenerative farm exists uh, and if it has some sort of you pick up I'm sure people are coming to it. Iowans are so indiscriminate writ large. People in the suburbs, people in the cities, people in the country uh, with pesticide use and a lot of this for agricultural reasons but even people in suburbia use it. My parents are guilty of this for a variety of reasons. Um, but do you have any advice for people coming to natural properties in terms of even just like uh, insect repellent? Do you think that has any impact on things? You know, it's probably pretty minimal. If it was a, if it was a, a national park or a, it was a, a park where you had thousands and thousands of visitors coming through all the mm -hmm. time, they're all spraying meat-based products all the time. You know, you're probably going to have some drift and some some runoff from that, or from you know coming off of people. Sure. We don't necessarily have that issue, and so you know, there's going to be other issues with just like traffic and stuff. But when you have that number of people. application of herbicide uh, almost absolutely absolutely necessary in the you know, years I've worked for the trust I've only done it one time. What was that one time? Uh, it was actually an area of very sensitive restoration on an old, um, uh, an old field mm -hmm. and there were clusters of nothing but multiple rows mm -hmm. and so I did some backpack uh, spraying of the clusters of multiple rows to kill those off. Although even a backpack spraying is pretty different than aerial well, and we consider aerial in that it's a full year application. Okay. We're not talking about like helicopters right. and, uh, and planes going across. Yeah. 
And so that's what I consider it. Yeah. yeah, right. And it's interesting to me that that for you is an extreme action when right. taken in the context of the state. That's a relatively judicious action. Absolutely, absolutely. And so what we normally do is, you know, you take something like um, multiflora rose like this. What we would do is we would cut it with loppers and then just dab onto the cut stem uh, a, a very small amount of an herbicide that's very concentrated. And so there's no drift, there's no motor spray, there's no real risk that it's going to kind of wash into the creek. Um, and it, but it kills this one plant. And that's a, a very, very uh, safe way to apply herbicide. And so it's called uh, cut stem and, or cut and treat. And so that, that's, that's the way that we, uh, we... How do you think about the risk of introducing it into the soil bio through the stem? Uh, again, it, it, it's all about the, the quantity. Mm. And so for something that small, I'm not overly concerned. If again, if we were just like wholesale spraying, sure. and, and when you're talking about soil, soil bloom, that's one of the reasons why the soil is so disturbed mm. on most agricultural land right now, mm -hmm. is because it's constantly being inundated with chemicals. Mm. And so you have herbicides, you have, you have pesticides, you have fertilizers, you fungicides. have all fungicides, yeah. all of those. Sure. You have those just being you know sprayed onto that landscape, and, and massive quantities are going into that soil. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be good for the the mm -hmm. microbial life that live on it. Do you have any advice for people? Probably the vast majority of people in Johnson County live in Iowa City or Cedar Rapids, or I'm not sure if that's Johnson County, but in a city, right, or suburb. Sure. Do you have any advice for how people can be better stewards of the land, even in their more urban context? Yeah, there's really not much of a reason to need to use um, either fertilizers or herbicides in an urban setting. Um, it, it might make your life a little bit easier, it might make your grass a little bit greener, but you really are adding to the pollution problem. And so it's, it's people don't use the correct dosage, they end up storing it for a long time or it gets dumped into a drain. There's really no reason to, to utilize those in an urban setting. Mm. Um, the best thing to do is plant natives when possible. I'm not talking about you know having to rip up your entire lawn and put. I in, am plant rip up your entire lawn. Well, so sucks. you can do that, but um, if 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 you have any sort of shrubs, there are native shrubs that can grow there. If you have any sort of ornamental grasses, there are beautiful native ornamental grasses that can grow there. And so not only does it look good, but they're not going to spread. Mm -hmm. And also there are a variety of insects and that will benefit from them. Mm -hmm. um, same thing goes with trees. People make this massive, uh, they don't understand they're doing it when they do it, but it's a massive decision. If you have a choice to plant an oak tree or to plant a ginkgo tree, not many people would say, hey, there's this massive difference. If it's, if it's a, so like plant a, both, plant the female ginkgo tree so you get the nuts well, and the oak for all the species. But here's the, here's the, the amazing thing is that the, the ginkgo tree supports zero insect species and bird species in, in Iowa. I mean, it was evolved for dinosaurs, which is cool. Right. They, but at the same time, yeah. and so it's I would say it's, zero. Like it's planting a what, like a Bradford pear, or okay. I just think it was cool. Sorry, I'm a little biased here. Sure, sure. But <laughs> so if you if you plant oak species, though, sure. there are hundreds, literally hundreds of species that will benefit from that tree. Whereas a ginkgo provides those nuts, plus it provides like some shade and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but it does nothing for the, the natural ecosystem of that area. Mm -hmm. And that's a real simple example that people make every single day. Mm -hmm. And so if possible, plant natives, um, if possible, you know, get rid of invasives, don't use herbicides, don't use pesticides uh, when possible. That's, that's my best advice. Mm -hmm. So since we've talked previously, I've pretty much entirely accepted your argument that there's such a need for wild spaces for wild spaces sake, especially in, in the connection you have as a person in Borough Land Trust specifically with bringing people in and that sort of connection to nature and education. But I still want to bring it back to my personal interest, which is how do we grow food in an ecologically minded way mm -hmm. that also nourishes humans in addition to the ecology. And so I have a couple questions that kind of relate to, to food production. And so one of them is just the wild foods of this place. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about what species, um, if you're interested in foraging, uh, that you could sustainably harvest? Yeah, so on our properties, there are a variety. Again, we're not, for the most part, we're not bringing additional species on, but there are so many. And there are foraging groups that are like always telling us about what we have, so it's really cool. We do have hazel on this property, um, not a lot, but that's one of the unique plants that we have. Um, there are uh, just a ton of different mushroom species on this property. Some of them, obviously, uh, not edible. Some of them can be edible. 
Join your local mushroom group if you're interested in. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I've seen people with, with you know, the common is the Burrell mushroom that everyone knows, but um, a variety of other mushrooms as well. I, if I may, I'm a really amateur mushroom harvester, but the uh, chicken of the woods chicken is the one woods. that's really tasty and yep. very distinct from anything that's poisonous, which is a good quality of mushrooms when you're first starting out. Um, in terms of other species, there are some things like uh, ramps or leaks that are, are on some of the properties. Unfortunately, those get over harvested uh, very easily, and so we do encourage people to, you know, not come out with the explicit idea of, of harvesting a lot of these things. If people pick some mushrooms, if people pick some, you know, hazel or something like that, that's fine. Well, but one thing one for issue. ramps that I've seen that a lot of people that have strong ethics when they're harvesting, because you want to leave the abundance for other people in nature and whatnot, is if you're harvesting a ramp, you can actually pick one leaf yeah. per plant, and it has the same flavor as the whole bulb. So that might be one, if you're trying to be ethical, uh, don't over harvest, especially in a common space like this. Right, right, where there's that potential, where people can come in and kind of decimate a population. Well, one of the cool things that we're actually doing out here on, on this particular property and in this particular location is there is a, a, a native tree called the pawpaw tree um, that is that has this amazing fruit called the pawpaw. And we are going to be planting a, a pretty large grove of those trees here it's the the appropriate habitat. Um, they're they're kind of a wetter species. They don't like to be uh, submerged in too much water. But if it floods, it's okay. Um, so these kind of like these plateau banks that we have out here are perfect for them. So we've done a lot of work to remove some of the invasive species. We're going to burn this section off, and then we're going to be planting pawpaws. Um, a side benefit of them, not only because they're that they're they're a great food species. But they are actually the, the only host species for a particular butterfly that is a threatened butterfly uh, called the, the zebra swallowtail. Mm. And so we're trying to get that population there. There's a uh, there's some small reports of those those butterflies in Johnson County. Mm. We're really at the very northern range of the species, but we we have the ability to uh, bring a pawpaw grove back to this area to try to support that species, same time bringing back a cool food source. Have you guys um, found any American persimmons, or is this a little bit not? No, not on our property we haven't. I know that there are some around, but not, not on any of our properties. I'm curious how you feel about chestnuts. So there's a lot of work with hybrid chestnuts, mm -hmm. with American Chinese. Uh, there's also some work with transgenic, transgenic American chestnuts. I'm curious if you've thought anything about that, if that's something you'd be interested in. Yeah, I think that again. Um, I don't know the if are, are are they native to this region chestnuts. That's an interesting question, right? So I think traditionally this is a little bit further west. Okay. But you have things like the helianthus, the um, roast artichokes, okay. the the Native Americans traded so far. Right. So it is interesting to me that I don't know of many native populations of American chestnuts here. Yeah. But you would have expected that based on the trade. The yeah, yeah. So again, I think that's a, that's a phenomenal option for kind of that urban landscape, right? And so if you're going to have trees that produce some sort of cool uh, nut or fruit or something like that, that's fantastic. That's great. Um, in an area that we are really trying to promote native biodiversity, uh, even if there's a question as to whether or not it was uh, native, we wouldn't put it here. That's, that's not a, a judgment on anyone who would, but it's just like there are people that, that go as far as they won't bring seed in unless the seed came from the property. Not just the species, but the seed itself. Mm. And so we're a little bit more, um, you know, we're less conservative to that. Where we're only bringing in species that are actually native to Johnson County. I feel like the Jason Taylor of even five years ago, we were even more in that camp. The yeah, a little bit. Um, you know, you kind of relax some of the stuff, but. It is, it's, it's really the, again, the goal, the purpose of what we're trying to do mm. is to restore this to what it was pre-settlement times. Pre-settlement times probably didn't have chestnuts here, possibly, mm. um, but probably didn't. And so that's just wouldn't be one of our, one of our mm. goals. And I think the, the last thing I want to end on is not even on food, but one of the things that I really admire about the Baroque work um, is the element of people care. So can you talk about uh, kind of specific things or specific types of programs you have in, you know, that they've engaged in and then kind of how people can think about you know using nature to improve communities as well yeah uh, well we're, we're very fortunate because this community is is very interested in nature and so mm -hmm. 
we would not be able to exist or be supported by a population that wasn't. And so I think that it's just, we're very fortunate to have, um, you know, this, this portion of, of Johnson County of, of Iowa that supports nature. That's great. Um, there are so many cool programs that are currently going on right now with regards to young, youth education in, um, in nature. So there's a new school that's focused, in, it's a nature-based school called Tamarack. Hmm. And we actually have a couple of our AmeriCorps members that are, are full-time with Tamarack oh, as, cool. as, as, as leaders of their groups. Um, we work closely with a, a nature program called Taproot, mm -hmm. which is an after-school and then also a, 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 a day, day school type program um, where they really just get kids out in nature and let them do their thing. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's a guided hike where they're going to be pointing out 10 different species or they're doing some certain activity. It's really about getting kids out and letting them explore. And so there are some other educational opportunities where they'll have um, kids coming out and just you know learning about nature, learning about um, carbon sequestration, learning about uh, you know tree growth, learning about all of these things, learning about pollinators, the importance of all this stuff. It's best to do that in the environment itself as opposed to reading about it in a textbook. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm, you know, I think it's really important for people to, to read about these things and learn about the, the, the philosophy or the theoretical side of it, but actually coming out and seeing this stuff is so important. So that's big too, for us as well. Um, the other part of the community is, is obviously adults. And so we really try to promote our, our properties as a kind of a respite. It's a place where people can get to. Like we're able to do this today, whereas we wouldn't be able to go to our office without masks on, et cetera, mm -hmm. because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And so just being able to get outside and enjoy nature with people, it's, it's nature isn't closed, whereas it's a safe space. And so we, we really have seen an uptick in our properties because of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, you know, again, it's a, it's a, it's a good thing to have for the community and we're, we're glad to be able to provide it. And is there one, Spring ephemeral you're most excited to see in the next couple weeks? Ah, great question. Um, so I'm a big fan of Dutchman's breeches. Mm, uh, I think that's just, you know, they're not the most rare species, but I always love seeing them. They're so unique looking. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably a big one. We do have a population of columbine here, which mm. is phenomenal. There's some cliffs. Speaking of um, edible flowers, I mean, don't pick all of them. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're for sure. Um, and, and so those are big. There's some of the anemones that are going to be popping up pretty mm -hmm. soon. Um, but the, the Turkey Creek property as well as the Big Grove property, the Big Grove property that we own, which is very close to here, it's 80 acres, it has better spring ephemerals than even here. Mm. Um, and it's just, it's, it's literally carpets of them at the right time of the year. Is it a little bit higher up in the watershed? Or yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's fairly close to the reservoir. It actually mm. bumps up to land that's owned by Army Corps of Engineers. Mm. Um, but you don't have a major creek running through it. Mm. And so it does, it feels a little bit drier, I would say, in most areas. Okay. I, I might put this in a different part. Well, I had one last question. Do you guys ever do any sort of land modification? So I'm putting in a pond, um, yeah. things like that, like land works? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we had a property, or we have a property called Belgium Grove. It's in, it's south of Iowa City. And again, it was agricultural land when it was donated to us. Um, they had done some work on it already, but then we, we wanted to reinforce that. And so we put about a four-ish acre pond on it, mm. and then that actually tied into um, a, a creek that runs through the property as oh, well. Cool. And so that's one example of it. Sure. Uh, same property, we've actually been approached. It's a very deeply incised stream, mm. meaning that it's, um, it's V-shaped. The, the difference in elevation from the creek bottom to the top is about 12 feet. Mm -hmm. And it's just because of all of the, the runoff and the, the speed of the water is just tearing mm -hmm. through there. And so it's not natural at all. Mm -hmm. And so we're actually doing some stream mitigation projects on that starting this spring mm -hmm. to try to slow the water down because obviously that water's tied into the, the Iowa River. Mm -hmm. And so the, the slower we can make it, the more sediment's gonna drop out, chemicals drop out and everything else before it gets to the Iowa River. And so mm. we're definitely supportive of some of the, the management of, of streams, especially through some big dirt work projects. Mm -hmm. um, we generally don't do it on, on prairie areas unless mm. there's an issue with erosion or something like that. Okay, and is there any final words of wisdom or messages you wanna send out to the peoples? Well, I just think that, you know, it's springtime, right? And so everyone loves to get outside. Uh, if you have the ability to, to get away from some of the more like traditionally managed areas where you have parks and things like that, they're phenomenal. But get out and see what actual nature looks like. I absolutely encourage that. Um, it's a great place to learn about things for people of all ages. And you really get to see some cool stuff. It changes every single time that you're out there. So I always encourage people to get out into real nature.
Thank you for your COVID sending. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Jason, so much. Absolutely. Appreciate it.